Uh, well, today we are uh, going to uh, take up another topic related to stressful experiences, but this time our discussion would be little different. What we have done till now is that we had uh, looked at uh, certain situations which are otherwise designated as a stressor by the individual and how uh, that situation, that stressor induces certain uh, physical, behavioral and psychological changes. Okay. And uh, we had talked about uh, you know how stress actually evolves and overpowers an individual. Study what we had done was we had taken a certain stressful situation at the workplace which can uh, ultimately make, make a person uh, feel completely emotionally exhausted that was the state of burnout. Now, uh, condition for a stress and burnout is that at the given point in time when you develop those symptoms you should be having such situation around you. Today we are going to talk about post traumatic stress or popularly called as post traumatic stress disorder PTSD okay. uh, where the actual stressful situation has already taken place. Okay. So, as of now you exactly do not have the stressful situation in front of you, it has occurred in the recent past okay. and now you are showing certain symptoms okay. and therefore, it is called post uh, traumatic. No? So, the traumatic state is over, during that state you did not develop these symptoms, but once that state is over you will start showing certain types of symptoms. Okay. I have deliberately written here post traumatic stress, I have removed disorder, uh, but when we uh, go ahead the next slide onwards, we will be referring it as PTSD basically which refers to disorder, uh, because uh, uh, the classification uh, proposed by the diagnostic and statistical manual consider this to be a disorder. Okay. But the last slide uh, pertaining to PTSD would be where we would talk about uh, the recent uh, arguments which says that it should be considered only as post traumatic stress and should not be considered as disorder. Now, historically if you look at uh, PTSD it is a relatively new addition to the DSM okay. and it is also you know popularly called as post Vietnam syndrome. Okay. Uh, there is an interesting history you know as to how PTSD got included in the uh, list of disorders in the DSM. We are not going into uh, that, but uh, it found a place in uh, DSM 3 the diagnostic and statistical manual uh, which is considered to be a bible of uh, you know this uh, diagnosis for psychological different type of psychological disorders. So, this was a special type of uh, you know symptoms which were realized during the Vietnam war in uh, uh, many of the soldiers and this is how people coined the new word called post traumatic stress. Uh, in fact, uh, if you look at the whole uh, you know history of clinical psychology and how different types of uh, disorders were identified, how their symptoms were identified, you would realize that uh, you know, two wars have really contributed a lot to the development in these two areas. Uh, one is uh, the second world war, a large number of uh, you know, psychological disorders and their symptoms uh, were identified during the war and then PTSD which is actually a byproduct of the Vietnam war. Now, we directly would jump to the major uh, criteria that is used to diagnose PTSD. I uh, will uh, recommend that you should not write it you know, because you are not going to practice as clinical psychologist in future. So, there is no point noting it down, we will understand it okay, 
a brief summary I will again uh, know forward it to you all. Okay. Now uh, these are uh, the diagnostic criteria for PTSD and what you find written here is actually what has been written in the DSM. When you read uh, it, I okay, will read it uh, here now and then we will explain it, uh, understand two three things now, what plays key role in terms of identification of the disorder. So, we will have A, B, C and then again we will have 1, 2, 3 likewise. The person has been exposed to a traumatic event in which both of the following were present, means the major important criteria is that the person who is being diagnosed with PTSD should have actually been exposed to a traumatic event, a precondition. Now, this clause A has three sections 1, 2 and 3, one says the person experienced, witnessed or was confronted with an event or events that involved actual or threatened death or serious injury or a threat of physical integrity of self or others. Okay. So, it has again a very wide spectrum, you should have either experienced it personally, one, two, you were not involved, somebody else was experiencing it first hand, but then you were a witness to it or was confronted uh, with an event or events that involved actual death or threatened death or actual serious injury or threatened uh, serious injury. Okay. So, finally, what you realize is that somewhere you realize that your survival is at stake, one, two, somebody else's survival uh, was at stake, but then you were a witness to it. Okay, say somebody has been shot dead okay, and you were a witness, it would be covalent to that. So, the first clause, the second clause which says that the person's response involved. So, now when you personally experience it or when you witness it, what actually you should have, uh, what should have been your response and it includes intense fear helplessness or horror. Okay. And it says that uh, in children uh, no, this manifestation could be in terms of extremely agitated behavior. Okay. So, section A which basically says that you should have had a threatening stimuli in your environment okay. and it says that either you should have personally experienced it or you should have witnessed it and your personal experience or witnessing the situation should have been accompanied with uh, reactions like horror, like uh, intense fear, like helplessness. So, this is the first important denominator. Second important denominator, the traumatic event is persistently re-experienced okay, in one or more of the following ways. Now, comes the uh, no interesting dynamics of this PTSD. The first clause that we discussed was there is a traumatic event and you are the first hand uh, uh, experience of it, you have that ex first hand experience or somebody else is experiencing it and you are a witness to it. Now, it says that whatever you saw at the first place, now it starts coming back to you. Okay. So, you are now persistently re-experiencing it in certain forms, what forms? One, recurrent and intrusive distressing recollection of the event including images, thoughts or perceptions. This means that you can you know it comes to you as certain flashbacks, okay, whatever had happened, okay, it comes to you in the form of recurrent, so periodic, uh, periodically that experience comes to you. It is intrusive means you are involved in some other task, suddenly this experience intrudes your conscious awareness okay. and this recollection of the event okay, is very distressing for you. Okay. It might come in the form of images, suddenly you know somebody who was being stabbed at visual comes, you sit in the class, you look at the slide and suddenly that visual comes, that is intrusive thought, intrusive image. Okay. It could be intrusive thought you know that whole process you start thinking of it 
or it could be uh, no uh, intrusive perception. So, that is one, two recurrent distressing dreams of the event, you do not have the conscious recollection, but it in, uh, repeatedly comes in the form of your dream. Okay. So, you repeatedly have the content that experience which you had yourself experienced or witnessed in the form of dream. Three, acting or feeling as if the traumatic event was reoccurring okay. and this can have many, 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 many symptoms. No? Four, intense psychological distress at exposure to interval or external cues that symbolizes or resembles an aspect of the traumatic event. Now, you experience that situation or you were a witness to that situation, anything that comes in the present time which resembles to any of the cue that was available there, okay, that suddenly you know, makes you psychologically feel extremely distressful, your, uh, your uh, reaction changes. I okay, will give an example, a real life example of this and the fifth one, the physiological reactivity on exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. Okay. Now, you have your entire physiological mechanism also reacts to it. Okay. So, basically what it says is first criteria, criteria A was that you should have either experienced it yourself or you should have been a witness to it. Okay. The second criteria says that the hopelessness, the fear, the horror that you experience you know, when you personally experience or witnessed it comes back to you in the form of intrusive thoughts, intrusive images. Okay. You have perception of it which basically disturbs you and if that does not happen, it might come back to you in the form of repeated dreams. Okay. Finally, anything which resembles to the earlier experience of yours, okay. if anything that resembles very much closure to it again comes back to you, your psychological reactions and your physiological reaction matches uh, that of the actual stressful event. Uh, I will give you a real life example, long back there was a massive earthquake in uh, Uttarakhand, okay, Pithoragarh was the area which was uh, which had uh, the which was the primary uh, sufferer, and uh, there were many many casualties. No? And uh, the major problem uh, basically was that uh, you know uh, those in that locality there were many houses uh, which were basically not uh, cemented properly, so you had uh, you no know, piles of stones okay put over each other, okay and there was no adhesive to put all of them together, many people died. Now, uh, this event happened, long after this I think uh, more than 2, 3 months after this event, somebody a labor who was working at a construction site okay, suddenly started having tremor. Okay, his whole hand started shaking, whole body started shaking, he had profuse sweating. What was the event at that time? A truck had come with the boulders that was a construction site. Okay. So, some uh, concrete and stone chips were needed for construction. So, this whole truck had come with big boulders, okay. it was uh, a truck with the hydraulic facility. Okay. So, the moment it reached the construction site. Okay, the you know, the driver had uh, just uh, put one end uh, no, go little up, so that the boulders can automatically fall down. This labor who was working somewhere nearby okay, heard this sound okay, and suddenly had uh, tremor and profuse sweating. The labors around him thought that perhaps he had uh, no, some extreme physical problem, the anticipation was some type of uh, cardiac arrest or something like that. So, he was taken to a primary health center 
nothing was diagnosed, he was taken later on to a hospital, nothing was diagnosed. Later on it was realized that this man happened to be from Pithodagad okay, and was one of the survivors of the earthquake that had taken place there. He lost his family members in the earthquake and therefore, he had to migrate all the way from Pithodagad to one of the urban areas of UP for uh, his livelihood. This whole sound okay, of uh, you know, stone chips you know, rolling down uh, from the hill top, okay, that sound resembled the sound of uh, the boulders falling from the hydraulic track. So, the cue he got from here okay, and immediately he associated with the earthquake in uh, Pithodagad and all that traumatic experience was recollected within fraction of seconds. This is what this means. No? that once you have any internal or external cue that resembles to the traumatic event, your trauma gets reactivated. Okay. Your psychological and physiological mechanism will start reacting the way it had done in the actual scenario. Okay. So, this is uh, criteria B. Now, we come to uh, criteria C, persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the trauma and numbing of general responsiveness as indicated by three or more of the following. Now, you have a list of seven different types of uh, reactions, minimum three or more. Okay. You should certainly show in your behavior to be diagnosed with PTSD. One, efforts to avoid thought, feeling or conservations associated with the trauma. Okay. So, there is a desperate attempt shown by the individual to avoid the thoughts and the feelings associated with trauma. Two, efforts to avoid activities, places or people that arouse recollections of the trauma. So, any person, place okay, or any activity that gets associated with the earlier experience, okay, the person always would try to avoid confronting them. Third, inability to recall an important aspect of the trauma. Okay. So, you were completely conscious in that entire process, but then a significant cue which is considered to be much more traumatic in uh, nature, you deliberately erase it. Okay. You say that I am not able to recollect it. Four, markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities. Now, you have a marked decline in uh, no sharp decline in your interest or, or participation in activities which otherwise uh, you consider to be significant and used to participate. Feeling of detachment okay, or estrangement from others, restricted uh, range of affect means uh, you show selected emotions only, you do not show the normal range of emotion that normal human beings show sense of for, uh, short and future. Okay. This means that you cut short on the expectation that you have uh, from certain uh, major things okay, such as career, marriage, children. Okay. Usually what happens? We usually you know keep on keep on thinking and uh, would think of the prospective things that can ha happen in the future. So, if I marry today then and then you have the whole lot of things that you imagine, if I have children then and then there is a lot of things that you imagine. Here what happens? The person starts okay, making it much and much shorter. Next, persistent uh, symptoms of increased arousal. In the earlier case here see it was all avoidance. No? In this case this whole bodily arousal is uh, involved. So, persistent symptoms of increased arousal okay, which is indicated by minimum of two of these five. One difficulty falling or staying asleep. So, you cannot sleep or if you sleep then you suddenly you know you have frequent wake up sessions. Irritability or outbursts of anger very easily you get irritated no, and you burst. Difficulty concentrating hyper vigilance, hyper vigilance is uh, that uh, we all are vigilant about our surroundings, okay. 
but you do not show hyper vigilance. For example, if you have to come to this room, okay, you would come and very quietly go and uh, take a chair. Okay. But imagine somebody who enters the room and then very suspiciously looks at each and every corner. Before you sit on your chair, no, you look at it from left, right. Okay, front, back, turn the chair, okay, or even uh, shake it, it does not fall, everything you test and then you sit, okay, that is hyper vigilance, no? that you should be vigilant, but then uh, no, there is no point in being uh, no, excessively vigilant. So, here one becomes excessively vigilant, exaggerated startle response, startle response basically is. Uh, the physiological reaction that the body shows immediately means it would be few seconds okay after uh, once the actual stressor comes into being okay so say for example if i take uh, say uh, you remember we had talked about cortisol when we were talking about stress two days back now, uh, say what is the cortisol level in your body as of now? Okay. Uh, what is your blood pressure, heartbeat, pulse rate, skin temperature, skin conductance, all these physiological parameters? Say uh, I attach sensors to have a look at it. Okay. The easy thing for measuring cortisol would be you put a cotton ball in the mouth. Okay and the saliva that the cotton will soak, okay, you can uh, analyze it using certain chemicals to find out the cortisol level available in the blood. Okay. So, very small thing, no? you can just put a cotton ball in the mouth, <coughs> attach sensors and then you say that okay, fine, no, take Kriti is taking place and you go and uh, see the events, just hypothetical example, I pray this does not happen and suddenly there is a you know, blast somewhere. Okay. One spark and your entire system will show certain reaction. Okay. The immediate reaction, that fractional reaction that your body had shown in terms of physiological reaction to such type of extreme situation would be considered a startle reaction. So, what happens if you graphically plot it, okay, it would be something like this and then suddenly there will be a big jerk and then it will now start know following a steep increase, but before this, this steep increase there is suddenly a quantum jump that is called the startle reaction okay. and therefore, you would realize that in many situations people would explain to you that uh, uh, when this event happened for few moments I could not realize what has happened, I could not realize what actually I should do. So, sudden bomb blast and then you freeze and after some time you say oh no, this is the time for me to run away, this is the time for me to look at others, this is the time for me to okay, sensibly you know see what actually has happened, but momentary okay, uh, complete closure of all the functions and within that process you suddenly realize that the whole bodily reaction has gone very high that is the startle reaction. So, that is exaggerated startle reaction. So, out of the five minimum of two should be uh, achieved and then the most important thing and which is uniformly uh, utilized for uh, you know, diagnosing each and every psychological disorder all psychiatric issues is the duration of the problem. Okay. Since, uh, how long you have been suffering from this type of say hyper vigilance, arousal and avoidance reaction. Okay. And here you see that it says that the total duration of having these symptoms should certainly be more than one month. So, if the event has taken place and after that till one month if you have these symptoms it is considered to be normal. Okay. Because you had experienced no uh, extremely catastrophic type of uh, situation. So, catastrophic experiences and therefore, you have all these numbing experiences, hypervigilance, arousal, um, avoidance reactions for one month it is fine, but
but then after month, one month if you still show these then you would be classified as a sufferer of post traumatic stress disorder. Okay. The disturbance cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. The reason why uh, uh, no, psychologists are interested in PTSD, one because of uh, no, different type of psychological processes attached to the symptoms and two because it impairs your social functioning, your occupational functioning and other areas where you could have uh, no, done the job much better, but because of these symptoms you refrain from participating in the event and you do not do that. Uh, before I come to uh, something else, you remember the very first topic that we were discussing, no? where we said that uh, the whole construct of normality can be analyzed in terms of statistical averages. Okay. In your mid sim exam also the first question perhaps was you know, uh, related to statistical average. Now, if you ask that how did psychiatrist realize okay, that these symptoms if they are uh, available for first uh, 30 days then it is normal and beyond 30 days then it is pathological. Okay. What is so sacrosanct about 30 days? This question can be asked no? that what is so sacrosanct? No? If this is a symptom then on the first day also it is a symptom, on the 31st day also it is a symptom. Okay. So, how does one classify that no? till 30 days it is fine and beyond that it is not fine. Okay. It is a big change no? because psychiatrist will con, uh, know, consider that post traumatic stress is a disorder. So, you are no more normal okay. just because you have you know, bypassed the limit by one day and therefore, you become pathological okay. and here comes the whole issue of again the statistical average. Okay. Uh, people with uh, post traumatic stress symptoms they have been uh, examined their uh, whole process has been carefully looked at okay. and people have seen that those who do not carry on their symptoms beyond 30 days limit okay. are the people it is like say the graph will go up and 30 days it will come down and the person becomes normal. Okay. So, that is the reason how you know, they have computed it. But then again this is a good indicator that again it is a statistical average okay. and we will once again refer to it little later when we come to the epidemiological data pertaining to PTSD. Okay. And these are you know interesting intellectual uh, things to think about you know. uh, that uh, say if I am on the 29th day with the same symptom I am normal, okay. I cross the limit and then you say nay nay this is pathological now. Now, PTSD is uh, no considered as it could be considered as acute and chronic depending on uh, the duration of the symptoms no? the avoidance, uh, hyper vigilance and the arousal symptoms. Okay. If the symptoms less than 3 months, so it is between 1 month and 3 month then it is considered to, considered to be acute, but if the symptom carries forward even after uh, no, uh, the 3 months period then it is considered to be chronic. Now, it primarily means that this is an exceptional type of a life circumstance, exceptional type of a situation that one has experienced and therefore, somebody uh, who have uh, the frequent recollection of it, somebody who develops numbness, somebody who become hyper vigilant. Okay. Now, these, these are considered to be uh, normal range of reactions within one, one month period, one month to three month it is acute in nature, beyond three month it becomes chronic. Now, comes this debate okay. in uh, 2005 uh, Joseph and Williams this was you know, basically uh, the supervisor and the PhD student pair, they said that PTSD symptoms what we talk about are actually normal reactions experienced by people in a response to a stressful and traumatic situations, indicative of need for cognitive emotional processing rather than an abnormal state of mind. 
So, they said again the same argument that we were taking know uh, that because the experience that I had okay, was of a very extreme nature and because I saw something of a very extreme nature okay, therefore, it primarily says that it also demands uh, know a cognitive emotional processing which will be of a very extreme order. And therefore, because the situation is extreme in nature, the response is extreme in nature, therefore, there is no point saying that this is an, this is an abnormal state of mind. Okay. Uh, I, I do not know if you have uh, ever got a chance to interact with people uh, who had some type of a very, very ex, a catastrophic type of experiences. I will just share one or two with you and then we will move forward. It was at one of the railway stations in UP only, uh, where uh, a group of students who had come to uh, participate in an exam, you know that we have exams uh, which are basically for recruitments where large number of students would migrate from different places in India to a particular city to appear in the exam. Banking, railways, there are hundreds and hundreds of such exams in our country. A group of students had given the exam, they were returning back. They had come all from small, small places. So, they were not aware of the high tension wire. Okay. And what it means to, uh, know when you say caution and these many volts okay, in the overhead cables of uh, for the railways. So, they very joyfully try to go to the top of the train, because the whole train was flooded with students and other passengers. And the moment the first person reached there and there was a trail of students going uh, trying to go to the rooftop there was a big spark and it was moment you know fraction of seconds and this whole body was completely charred and it was not only one no three four people who were very very close to that student this entire episode uh, no there was not even a time to you know blink no so one blink and the event was over It was a crowded uh, railway platform and many people saw this event. Okay. Somebody I know who saw this event and was you no know, later on in his life he became extremely scared of uh, you know going by trains pulled by electric engines. And he can see that you no, know, the all the bogies are made of metals, and he knew that metals are good conductor of electric currents. Okay. How whatever explanation you give to him, it doesn't work. Uh, this weekend, uh, I was in a place very close to Kanpur. And I was told that uh, you know, there, there is a temple where next day uh, on the occasion of Mahashivratri there would be a whole lot of crowd coming here for worshipping Lord Shiva. Two years back and uh, an accident had taken place, a whole lot, lot of mob was there uh, to celebrate this occasion religious festival, some dance event was taking place and then somebody went to the rooftop and once again the high tension wire happened to cross it. And because it had rained, therefore the current could no immediately pass on to this in that entire wet region. Okay, and there were two thousand casualties. Again, momentary. But what was further told was even worse. Many people died. They were their bodies were completely charred. No, because of that. Uh, high intensity of the current and few who uh, you know were either completely shocked and therefore frozen or those 
who had still had life in them the police evacuated the entire area you know, overnight and all these bodies were dumped into the river Ganges is just one kilometer from there. So, all these bodies were dumped into the river police did not think of checking uh, or themselves or getting checked by a medical expert whether X had died or still he has some life and therefore, there was no point making a distinction who should be cremated and who should be sent to hospital uniformly everybody was thrown in the river. So, those who did not die out of electric shock died because of drowning in river Ganges. Now, if you become a witness to events like this, these are not small events in life, no? these would change your life forever. Uh, I do not know if you have seen this clip, when 26-11 attack took place in Bombay, uh, the young uh, worker who was there in Shamiana restaurant in Hotel Taj, okay, later on he gave his interview. Okay. I use his uh, no video clip for some other course, no, uh, where he uh, explained the whole uh, situation no, and he said that uh, I was there in uh, the Shamiana restaurant when this attack took place, I do not remember the number of guests, he said some number 24, 26, some number he said that these many guests were there in the restaurant when the terrorist attack took place. What he beautifully explains and in a very pensive state uh, is that he said that no I had uh, asked everybody to hide somewhere because there was a place to hide and there was a gate leading outside the hotel from uh, that area. So, I asked everybody to hide there okay. and uh, I told them that once there is a silence I will open that gate and I'll, you all can go out of the hotel from there and at that time a young couple said that uh, you know, their small child had gone to the toilet which was on the other side of the corridor okay, and the corridor was where these terrorists were moving and they said that we need to go there, we cannot go out of the hotel without taking our child. So, we will go to the rest uh, to the toilet and then this boy thought that if he goes to the toilet the terrorist will know that there are there could be few more people in the restaurant hiding here, so all of them will die. So, he said that uh, do not worry you stay here in a hidden thing and then I will go and bring back your child. He crossed that area that corridor and the moment he was in the corridor okay, uh, he could hear the bullet shots aimed at him, he could narrowly escape and then suddenly one of the terrorists had thrown that hand grenade that the whole area would explode and this man would die. Fortunately, that hand gradient did not explode okay. and because of uh, other movements okay, this boy could manage to go to the toilet, bring the child back okay, and all these people survived. Now, this boy says in that tape, he says that you know since then that sound of the hand grenade falling in the corridor, the whole audio effect, it comes to me repeatedly, you know, wherever I am suddenly you know that audio comes to me. What happened when that hand grenade fell on the ground and he anticipated death, you know. so it just frozen moment and that sound and then he realized oh nothing has happened okay. and terrorist anticipated that this area will blow and therefore, he also ran away and this boy could manage to go to the toilet and come back with the small baby. Now, these are ex unique experiences in life, no? not many people will have it, but those who would have it, okay, uh, the other camp in psychology therefore, says that no, these are all extreme situations in life. And therefore, when you think of a statistical average, you cannot have the statistical average, no, because there would be a handful of people who would have experienced it. You are getting my point. So, why do not you consider this as an extreme reaction to an extreme situation rather than saying that this is a pathological state of mind? This is a debate, there you will find if you read uh, literature in uh, 
psychology pertaining to PTSD. You will find uh, you know, many many uh, psychologists endorsing this viewpoint that this should be considered as post traumatic stress and disorder should be deleted from this term. Okay. But then you have the whole camp of psychiatrists still arguing that this should be considered as post traumatic stress disorder. I just thought I will make you aware of both the facts. Okay. I am not taking a side whether you should go accept this or you should accept that you should have your uh, in case you are interested read details and uh, have your own opinion. Now, if you look at the prevalence rate, okay. prevalence rate is once again no, you have uh, uh, data from uh, multiple uh, sources and then you try to figure out uh, the percentage of victims okay, who develop certain types of symptoms after experiencing a catastrophic uh, event. It has been realized uh, that 55 percent of the rape victims they develop PTSD post traumatic stress. 35 percent of the victims of child sexual and physical abuse they also develop uh, post traumatic stress. 17 percent of those who experience uh, physical or armed assaults they also experience post traumatic stress and 7 percent of the survivors of severe accidents they also experience post traumatic stress. Now, if you look at the prevalence data then again uh, you come forward with a question. So, if 55 percent of the rape victims uh, you know, suffer from post traumatic stress what happens to the remaining 45 percent? That can be a question. No? What happens to the remaining uh, say 65 percent in the case of uh, childhood sexual and physical abuse. Okay. What happens to the remaining uh, 93 percent in the case of severe accidents. Okay. And this was something once we had the prevalence data that was the time when uh, you know, a group of psychologists started thinking that what happens to the left out percentage. And that led to another area of research in psychology which finally led to uh, a construct what is called as post traumatic growth. Okay. I must tell you that in the recent years uh, there have been several 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 development. And if you remember the very first topic that we had discussed uh, as part of this course, uh, where we were talking of the uh, biomedical model, you remember that. So, one of the important things in biomedical model was uh, that there have been changes uh, in the area of uh, medical practices, there has been changes in the area of psychological sciences also. No? Say, in medical practices, you have something like uh, community health services. Okay. Uh, similarly, in psychology also a new branch gradually came up what is called as positive psychology. And if you read once again uh, know literature in positive psychology, uh, you will read about post traumatic growth, resilience, coping, healing, these are know the very uh, common topics that you will find in the text pertaining to positive psychology. Now, this term was you know, formally introduced in 1995 by Trotsky and Cohen okay. and they basically define uh, post traumatic growth as the positive psychological change experienced as a result of the struggle with highly challenging life circumstances. So, all the life circumstances that we were talking about, the worker in the Shamiana restaurant when 26-11 took place the man on the railway platform who saw uh, four students uh, burning within few seconds, the people who had gone to worship uh, a god and saw 2000 casualties. Okay. So, he says that when you are put in difficult situations okay, and when uh, your life circumstances challenging life circumstances force you okay, to struggle once that phase is over you could evolve like a much refined human being. Okay. And those positive psychological changes are defined as post traumatic growth means after the traumatic event has happened a, a disorder developed that was the first thing that we discussed. Now, we are discussing the opposite side of uh, the continuum that the traumatic event is over and now you have evolved you have grown up much better and therefore, it is called post traumatic growth. Now, there are uh, 
three broad spheres where changes have been uh, you know, realized after the traumatic event is over. One in the interpersonal relationship, you start valuing relationship, human relationships like anything. Okay. So, today your father gives you a call, but um, uh, your mother is hospitalized and you say, Nay Papa, Tekriti is coming just this weekend. So, you please manage, I would not be able to come and do let me know. Every day, you know, I will uh, be in touch with you and let me know uh, how mother is, but Papa, please. So, importance is given to Tekriti and mother is compromised with. There are you no know, several life situations you know, where uh, you know, what in psychology we called as conflicting choices. You, know. you come forward with cases in life where you, know, you have two choices and you can opt for only one and both of them are equally compelling. Okay. Now, what to do? It is very difficult, you know. there are conflicting choices. What has been witnessed that after uh, you know, uh, that traumatic event when one develops this post traumatic growth, when one evolves, the major change that takes place is in terms of defining human relationship. So, now even your relationship with a stranger is extremely valuable to you, forget about your own relatives. Okay. You start valuing them more, much more. Two, self perception, the way you have been defining yourself that also undergoes a big change and three, the philosophy of life changes. Okay. So, what you initially thought was extremely important and you should have certainly attained in life, now you think that come on here those things are just rubbish. Okay. Life needs much more. Okay. So, broadly the changes have been found under these three spheres. Okay. So, you start valuing family and friends, you increase uh, no, uh, self disclosure means things that you always thought retaining with yourself, nahi yaar, I would never share this with others. Now, you feel there is no point no keeping several things within you, you take pride in sharing yourself with others. You become much more kind to others, okay. altruism increases, altruism is selfless type of service that you provide to others, altruism increases and usually your gen, you become generally much more open. Okay. Earlier you remember we this is again with reference to the frame of reference. No? So, the frame of reference suddenly becomes very porous, okay. the life philosophy has changed. Modification of self perception also takes place wherein you find increase in your resilience, your ability to fight back, wisdom, strength and acceptance of your limitations. So, you very gladly and very generously say that I am sorry I do not I cannot do this, something that you were very shy of in the beginning okay. and change in the philosophy of life okay, also takes place with added wisdom. So, you have more you become more and more wiser in the process. Three different uh, models have been proposed uh, which uh, defines post traumatic growth, how it happens, what are the factors that contribute to it, the whole cycle of post traumatic growth. But even though I say that three uh, models have been suggested, I have put only two models. I will just touch the third model uh, in brief and I will tell you the reason why I am not going to the third model. The first model is called the functional descriptive model, again it was proposed by Tradisky and Cohen, you remember Tradisky and Cohen was the first one to propose the concept of post traumatic growth okay. and this model was proposed in 1995 and by this time it has been revised four times. Okay. I must tell you that this is a theoretical model and then there is another theory what is called as the organismic valuing theory given by Joseph and Linley. Uh, we had referred to Joseph and Linley's work of 2005 saying that this was a student supervisor pair. Okay. And the third theory is called bio psycho social viewpoint. Okay. Now, this basically has a bit of psychology, a bit of biology, a bit of sociology, it has also evolutionary angle. So, it is just a viewpoint and that is the reason why we are not going to the third one. These two models we would uh, discuss at length tomorrow. 
but I must tell you that both these models are still theoretical models okay. and I will also share with you one of my student who did his PhD uh, no, uh, trying to empirically test the functional descriptive model. Okay. So, tomorrow when we assemble we will talk about these two models and then we will move to two remaining topics resilience and coping.